God is good. Um, I'm going to share a brief word and then we're going to pray today and we're going to live different from the way that we came in Jesus' name. Uh, I'm going to play with two words. Number one, um, Psalm chapter 118 and verse 22. And the other verse is Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your strength. Speak through my mouth. Give us ear to hear. And I pray that we will all live different today from the way that we came in. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to give some background and then we're going to get into the, the, the scriptures that I uh, chose for this morning. Um, in the time when Jesus came into the, the earth, um, the community that the Lord came into was a community that had a lot of similarities to the church world today. Number one, everybody feared and loved God passionately. Number two, they all had a common enemy in the Romans. Number three, everybody had a hope for a coming Messiah. And they had a hope that this Messiah would crush the enemy. And so they were united in all these areas. But among themselves and within themselves, there was very deep, 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 divisions and deep lines of demarcation that separated people from people. There was the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees that had arguments over supernatural, um, the belief in afterlife uh, and, uh, or not. There was divisions with the, the, a group called the Essenes, which many people feel that John the Baptist was a member of, which were a very extreme operation an extreme unit of people who were very holy and lived in isolation, similar to the monks that would follow <clears throat> the desert, monks that would uh, take root in the church culture in the second century. Uh, and there was the complicated relationship with the Samaritans. The Samaritans was a division, both ethnic and religious, that made for a very complicated uh, relationship, all believing in one God, but they had very, very strong personal convictions and personal, uh, uh, personal animosity. All right, each one of them had a common belief in Messiah, but they believed that Messiah, when he comes, he will justify their position and show how much more superior they were than their rival groups. All right, very much like today. Everyone loves God. Everyone is believing for similar things. We're all leaning in the same direction, but there is division. There is great division over interpretation of scripture, application of scripture, what to wear, what not to wear. In our personal context here in Ethiopia, within the evangelical community, doctrinal positions, uh, personality issues, all kinds of things divide the church. There are, in fact, over 30,000 branches of church, of church practice and denomination in the world today when Jesus was always praying that we would be one. As someone missed the memo somewhere, right? And so <clears throat> all of us, we have our persuasion, and even Beza, we have our own persuasion. It's impossible to be in the world and not have a persuasion. But I believe that although we have our convictions, we have a deep-seated personal belief also that God is greater than our conviction. And it's important to have this conviction because God is greater than our conviction. And when Jesus comes, uh, he does not come to justify one group over the other, but he comes to set the captives free. 
Praise the Lord. When Jesus came to the earth, he did not come as a Pharisee, but he talked to Pharisees. Come on, somebody. He did not come as a Samaritan, but he talked to Samaritan women. He did not come as a sinner, but he was a friend of prostitutes, sinners, and tax collectors. Right? So Jesus was not for all, but was with all. Jesus was not in all, but he was for all. All right? He did not come to justify a position. He came to break the back of the devil. He broke through the chains and he sets the captives free. He said in Luke 4, the first statement, public ministry, first proclamation of Jesus. It was not endorsing a political candidate candidate, or political objective. Ooh, hallelujah. He said, the spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. See, all of our different positions, they are good, they are intellectually stimulating, but they do not necessarily set us free. That is the work of Jesus. Our positions might be strong and it's good to have convictions, but the devil is not afraid of your conviction. He is afraid of Jesus. And when Jesus shows up, he takes care of. Hallelujah. So this is not a gathering. The church is not to be a gathering where we tout, tout our preferred position Although that is necessary from time to time because we need to have a good foundation of what we believe and why. But we have to know that when it comes to this business of dealing with the devil, it's not a doctrinal position. It's a battle of light and darkness. It's a battle of bondage and freedom. Can we say amen? And today Jesus is just as anointed as he was then to set the captive free, to minister to. He is the good shepherd. He leads us to the still waters. He is after our wounds. He is after our hurts. He's here to bind the brokenhearted. Can I get amen or something in the house of God today? He is for you. And he is after the enemy who is tormenting you, the enemy who has subjugated you and who has oppressed you. That is his business. He is here to set his people free. He is here to go after our hurts. Hallelujah. Can we say amen? Amen. Because in reality, behind the scenes of all this argumentation, there's a real enemy who actually locks himself up in these different camps. You have to understand the enemy, his main, his greatest threat, his greatest point of attack is the church of Jesus Christ. Because we're the only institute that represents a threat to him and his kingdom. Uh, he does not go to parliament. He does not go to Yeshi Bunna. He does not go to Nok Madia. He goes after the church because those are just businesses. Those are just neutral entities. We are a force that has been designed to go after. In fact, Jesus said of the church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. So when he hears that and he knows that he works overtime to make us divided, 30,000 plus divided, right? He himself does not operate in division. He operates in unity. He is unified to ensure our division. Jesus is above our, our doctrine, denominational, doctrinal, theological argumentation. He is Jesus. He is the good shepherd. So today, in the spirit of Jesus, I serve notice on the devil today. That today is a day of great visitation for somebody. I received this message on the plane. And I feel in my spirit that there is somebody who has been in a cycle that you cannot break. A darkness you cannot break. It's not that you do not love the Lord. It's not that you're not faithful to his word. It's not that you are doing your best. It's that this enemy has been tormenting you. And what you need today is a heavy dose of Jesus himself. The Son of Man was revealed not to shore up the doctrinal position. The Son of Man was revealed to destroy the works of the enemy. And I am on assignment today just like Jesus was on that day when he entered the synagogue in Nazareth. That the Spirit of God is here. That the yoke has to be broken. That there's some things that are not taught out. There's some things that's not preached out. There's some things that's driven out by the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. And I release that word now for somebody in Jesus name there is deliverance in the house today there is freedom in the house today God is light in him there is no darkness amen praise the name of the Lord can we say amen, amen. can we say amen? amen hallelujah 
Now, I wanted to just clarify. Um, I want to en encourage the church to position the church today to receive from Jesus. I'm not here to give lecture today. We'll do that another day. Today, I am after this heaviness, this cyclical bondage that is releasing so much poison in your life. Hallelujah. I believe that today is the day where the lies of the enemy give way to truth. Why his deception comes to an end today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, now this is the thing we have to understand. Um, we have to position ourselves a little bit better than we are right now. Um, how we approach Jesus determines what we receive from Jesus, right? He's attracted to the humble. He's attracted to the hungry. Uh, he resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Am I right about it? Um, and, and so I, I just want to encourage everybody to just let go of that uh, attitude of resting in your understanding of what you think that you know that you know. The Bible says we're to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. There's a head knowledge of God and a heart knowledge of God. Head knowledge will not work for you when it comes to receiving from God. It will stimulate the thinking, but it won't deliver you from the bondage. It's a heart engagement, hallelujah. And sometimes this needs to be surrendered in order to receive the river of God. Can we say amen? amen. Yeah? Praise the Lord. Now, let me just paint this picture for us today. Um, when Jesus was on the earth, eh, he, it's interesting, he broke the bondage in the house of the Pharisee. He broke the bondage in the house of the Sadducee. He set the Samaritan woman free. And he was baptized by John the Baptist. He was anointed by sinners. And he released the, the, the thief on his one side into paradise with him. He's not to firm up. He's not here to firm up your position. He's here to set you free. And he will set you free at this church. And he will also set you free at that church. He will set you free, free even at the other church down the street. He will set you free. He is on a mission not to firm up our doctrinal position. He's on a mission to set the captives free. Hallelujah. It's how we receive from him needs to be on a deeper level than what we know about him. Hallelujah. He understands hunger. He, doesn't, he, he resists the proud. He resists the proud. Now there was two people, significant people that came to Jesus that's recorded in the Gospels. And I just want to kind of paint this picture today of these two people because I believe that somebody's going to receive something from heaven today. Are we ready? Number one, there was a man named Nicodemus. He shows up throughout the Gospels. Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3. He came to him at night. When the Bible describes Nicodemus, it says he was of the a member of the ruling council of the Jewish people. It's also called the Sanhedrin. He is a ruler, a member of the rulers, the ruler ruler. You know, when you have ascended to the position of rulership, it comes with some clout. In today's language, he is the bishop of the church of so and so and such and such. He is the senior pastor of Beza International Church. See that when you say that, you know, put that on your business card. Right? When you know you started in a car that needed faith, you kind of arrived, right? Yeah? One day I was invited to speak at a meeting. It's like, it's like the World Cup for pastors. Kind of arrived. Nicodemus was like that. He worked hard. He's achieved a lot. He's the man. But he was in conflict because although he was a member of the Pharisees, Eh? He also had an appetite for Jesus. He was curious about what Jesus was doing. And he, 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 he had never heard or seen anything like this. He loved what he was seeing over here, but he was still a member of the Pharisees. He was a member not just of the Pharisees, he was a member of the ruling council. Whew. Are you following what I'm saying? He had position, he had clout. 
And he could not reconcile the two. Now this is important to be able to know the dividing line because the Bible says that the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. He's a member of the builders. The builders hate the, 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 the stone. But Nicodemus is a member of the building and he loves the stone. How do you, what do you do? How do you reconcile the two? So he concluded in his own mind, he came up with a plan, I'm going to meet with Jesus at night. At night where nobody can see me, eh? I can do my business in private. That way I can maintain my membership and my position and also get what I need from Jesus at the same time. So he came to Jesus at night hmm? and he, st he started asking him questions. Hi, Jesus. Welcome. Oh, so nice to meet you, Jesus. You're amazing. You know that? Uh, Sammy, come here. Be Jesus for me. Nicodemus and Jesus, I did this in the Amharic service and Manasseh refused uh, to be Jesus. He said, no, pastor, you be Jesus. Someone mark him for a raise. That man want me to be Jesus. So now Nicodemus is coming to Jesus as equals, right? I'm also a member. I'm protecting my reputation. You're also a member. Let's talk. And the words that he said, if you remember the story, he said... No one can do such miraculous signs unless God was with him. You know, that's the thing that's been bugging him this whole time. Yeah. How can you do this and not be part of the, the Jewish ruling council like me? We've been trying to do this our whole lives and you just come, you're not even a member of the council and you're doing, this is amazing. Let's talk about it, Jesus. How? How do you do all these signs, hmm, Jesus? I mean, no one can do this unless they come from God, but you're not from, well, maybe you are. So tell me, Jesus. I have questions, Jesus. See? And what did Jesus tell him? He bypassed the question and throws in the confusion. Because he came to him as an equal. And you cannot come to Jesus as equal. Yeah? He is a master. You are not co-masters. You are not co-rulers. There's only one ruler in this. So he said, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Confusion. How, wait, how can a man? How can a man be born again? A second time going into the mother's womb. How, Jesus, you are Israel's teacher and you don't even know these things? You see how Jesus is playing with him. He's toying with. So Nicodemus came to Jesus as a ruler of the council. He preserved his reputation. The council had rejected Jesus. They had rejected the stone. Nicodemus loved the, the builders and he loved the stone. The builders hated the stone. Nicodemus, a member of the builders, loved the stone. He had to reconcile. So he said, let's have this conversation. And he left more confused than he came in. There was another ruler. The Bible tells the story of another ruler. He was a synagogue, ruler of the synagogue, a man named Jairus. Like Nicodemus, he also had a lot of clout. He also had a lot of prestige. He also had a lot of position. Maybe he started as a Sunday school teacher, and now he's ruler of the synagogue. He has his picture on the wall. Maybe he has a little token of his achievements in his drawer. You know, first degree, second degree, when I'm a ruler. I'm trying to milk this. Come on, help me. Right? And, and he also came to Jesus. But he did not come to Jesus the same way Nicodemus came to Jesus. The Bible says when he came to Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he worshipped. He did not come as equals. He's a member of the builders, but he doesn't care about the builders today. He comes with worship. He says, he's worshipped. Now, now, what's the difference between the two? Both of them are rulers have reputation with the people, they have their denominational papers and credentials and licensing, unlike some of us. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hmm? What's the difference? The Bible says that Jairus had a 12-year-old daughter and she was at the point of death. Somehow, the desperation of his situation caused him to let go of his reputation, let go of his position in the society. Let go of his name. Let go of everything that was important. It's no longer important because we've come to a place of desperation. And God understands desperation. He understands hungry.
He understands empty. And he emptied himself in front of... He didn't come at night. He came in full view of everybody. And he bowed before his feet. And he said, please help me. My daughter. My daughter is at the point of death. And Jesus went and healed his daughter. You remember the story. Miraculously healed the daughter. Nicodemus left confused. Jairus left with a healing. Today... It's very likely today that somebody leaves church confused. But it's also likely today somebody leaves with healing, with deliverance, with breakthrough. Don't come with your CV to the presence of God. Don't come with your experience in the presence of God. Don't come with how much you've been working so hard for the Lord. You have years in your, in your background of working and doing so much. Come empty. Come broken. The Bible says unless you change and become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. A little child is very inexperienced and knows nothing. Come like you don't know, although you do know. Come like you have nothing, although you have something. And God will meet you at the point of your need. Hallelujah. Can we say amen? Can we say amen? I think that's the problem with so many of us. Uh, even a church like Beza, you know, even out, like people know about us over there. Oh, Beza, I heard about that church. There's somebody, I heard about that church. Yeah, it's a good church. Anything that is of the increase is just extra. The big deal in the house today is Jesus. Anything good that has been accomplished is because of Jesus. You know, it's amazing because when we started Beza, I, I kind of, every time I hear stuff like that, when you travel, you hear stuff like that. You're, you're introduced with extra, you know, people. We started with an experiment that said, let's, we've, we've been in, we had been in ministry for many years, and we said, let us just try this thing of relationship. God spoke to us to put relationship first. So we said, let's try relationship because he said, if you do relationship, I will do ministry. Right? And you know, you're always under this presupposition that you're the one that does ministry. Right? We do ministry for God, but God showed us very clearly that we can do no ministry for God because that's the role and the work of the Holy Spirit. Some of you in here, I know your stories. That was not good preaching. That's the Holy Spirit doing an amazing work that no man can do. I know many of you, I'm even looking at this congregation, I know your stories. That's just a miracle. You all are a, you are a miracle sitting in here. So God has reserved the things of ministry to himself. It's not my work. It's not my responsibility. But at the same time, he said, relationship is something that only we can do and not God. God cannot do relationship for us. He gave us the example. He gave us the instruction. But that work is our eternal homework. So God can't do ministry. Uh, God can't do relationship and we can't do ministry. Right? That's what he told us. So we, we, we made a commitment that whatever it looks, we'll try our very best to do relationship. Meaning that particularly in the leadership, eh, we, won't, we, we will find a way to make it happen relationally. And we'll leave the ministry to God. If there's ever a hard decision to be made, we will make a hard decision on the, on the ministry side, not on the relationship side. That's the kind of deal that we started when we started in the house 17 years ago. And so whatever has happened since, it's just God, right? It's all His doing. But that thing can deceive you so easily. Even today, I am a pastor, but before Him, I am nothing. Your achievement, whether it be in ministry or in the business or in whatever your hand, the work of your hands has led you to do, it's Him who is alone worthy of all the glory. Do not be a Nicodemus today. Be a Jairus. Eh? Leave your reputation, lay it at his feet, and deliverance will come. Healing will come to your situation. Victory will come in the place of defeat. He will touch every hurting place because that's what the Good Shepherd does. And I had a, a sense in my spirit, I received this message on the plane yesterday we arrived. And the Lord put in my heart, somebody is in desperate need of a touch from God.
You are gripped in a deep, deep darkness that only God can heal. And I want to announce to you that today is your day of deliverance. Today is your day of the touch from heaven. Today is the day that the cycle breaks, the pain breaks, the visitation comes, the healing comes. He is that good, hallelujah. But don't bring your Nicodemus today, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Bring your Jairus. Bring your appetite, hallelujah. Bring your hunger today, hallelujah. He's the same Jesus either way. Nothing is going to tarnish his reputation. But bring your hunger today, amen. Can we say amen?